Good afternoon and welcome to today's CME activity. The speaker and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. You will receive a SurveyMonkey link after today's activity. If you're viewing online, I'll list the link into the chat section. And if you're viewing after the fact, you will find the survey link in the description section of the video. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Olivia Peralta. Dr. Peralta is a third year resident for the internal medicine program and graduated from American University of the Caribbean for medical school. After graduation, Dr. Peralta will be staying in the Gainesville area, working as a hospitalist for Northeast Georgia Physicians Group. Join me in welcoming Dr. Peralta. All right, hey everybody, can you guys hear me okay? If I talk like this, yeah, cool. All right, so like she said, I'm Olivia Peralta, I'm a third year resident with internal medicine. Um, this is my grand rounds presentation. It's gonna seem a little bit random. I chose lactic acidosis, but I hope that I can make it sort of interesting and applicable going forward for all of you, especially if you're practicing in the hospital setting, whether it's ICU or just you know general hospital medicine. Um, so lactic acidosis, who cares and why? Um, like she said, I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, so some of the objectives we're gonna go through, I'm gonna start off with a clinical question and hopefully it'll kind of get you thinking um, in the mindset that you know I'm gonna steer you towards. Um, and then we're gonna go through a little background and history of lactate. Um, we're gonna kind of go over the pathophys, so you're gonna remember some of your med school things from way back when. Um, I'm going to touch on acidemia. That is a huge topic in and of itself, so I'm not going to dwell on it for very long, but it will be important to this topic. Um, there's a couple different types of lactic acidosis, um, why we care about it, the importance of it. We'll go through some management um, and talk about some nutrients um, and lactic acidosis, how they're related. And then we'll, uh, I'll do a quick conclusion and we'll have time for some questions. So like I said, I'm gonna start off with this clinical question. It's gonna be a pretty vague, um, you're probably going to want a lot more information, but just take it at face value. So you have a 44 year old female alcoholic with a known B cell lymphoma. She's not on chemo. Um, she's admitted to the ICU with shock and acute renal failure. Uh, after 36 hours of giving her Vanco and Meripenem, in addition to the appropriate IV fluid resuscitation and also being on continuous IV fluids, her MAP remains around 65. Her white blood cells are 38,000, which is up from presentation at 32,000. Uh, she's now oliguric and encephalopathic. Apart from her persistent acidosis, she has a bicarb of seven, a lactic acid of eight, um, and the above information that I've already given you, her labs are pretty normal. Um, and so I want you to think about what your next step in management is. It can be a knee-jerk reaction right now and hopefully I'll kind of delve into it towards the end of the presentation. But, you know, do you want to add a fourth presser? Um, she's already on pressers. Uh, do you want to add mycofungin? Do you want to give more IV fluids in addition to what she's already getting? Or do you want to give some thiamine? Do you have a question? No? Okay. Don't have a question, but do you want someone to... No, I just want, everyone can just kind of think about this question. We'll get back to it at the end, and then I want you to kind of give me some of your input on it, okay? Excellent, thank you. So we'll go through a little bit of background information. I know this, again, is going to seem a little uh, random and interesting, hopefully. So back in the 1850s, um, for obviously economic reasons, French scientists wanted to know why some of their wine wasn't tasting very good. Um, it didn't ferment into their delicious alcohol like they had hoped. Um, Louis Pasteur, which you may recognize his name, was somebody who uh, volunteered readily to help figure out why this wine wasn't tasting good. He had already been studying yeast. He knew that yeast um, produced alcohol from sugars, but one of the things he developed along the way when he was looking into this was that there were some organisms that if they contaminated that process, they produced lactate. Um, and that is what made the, the wine not taste very good. Um, so he was the one that really kind of helped um, spur the, you know, uh, 
discovery of lactate. And as you can see here, Louis Pasteur and his alcohol. Um, so spurring um, from that discovery or that, you know, um, the start to the um, pathway and everything, three guys, um, Gustav Emden, Otto Meyerhoff, and Jakob Parnas, they were the ones that formally elucidated the what we now call the glycolytic pathway. Um, this was all the way in the 1940s, so this was almost 100 years later um, after they started realizing wine didn't taste very good all the time. Um, when they started, um, you know, they thought it was going to be a fairly simple thing. Okay, lactate, we got sugar, how do we get there? And then this happened. Um, obviously, not all of these enzymes and steps were discovered um, by them, but they really helped figure out the, the gist of the pathway that now is the glycolytic pathway. So lactate, we're going to kind of, you know, all of this is related, but right now I'm going to focus on the lactate. So it's normally produced by the body, um, anywhere from 15 to 30 millimoles per kg per day. Um, the liver does most of the metabolism of it. It does about 60%. The kidneys also metabolize it, um, and they metabolize it into glucose. So I'll show you a different picture in a second, but remember the glucose comes in, there's the glycolytic pathway that can produce lactate, but it can also go back all those pathways go back and forth. Um, some of it's also metabolized into CO2 and water via the Krebs cycle, TCA cycle, if you remember that. Um, and the skin, red blood cells, brain tissue, muscle, and the GI tract are the ones that we really look at when they produce excess lactic. Um, and I've got a little picture there just kind of showing, you know, you've got the muscles, the blood, the liver, and it all kind of goes back and forth. Um, this is probably reaching into the cobwebs a little bit, some of the pathophys of all of this. Um, but what I was just saying about how lactate can kind of go back and forth between glucose, you know, it can use LDH and it can turn into pyruvate. LDH has a few different isomers, I'm not going to get into too much, but it can go lactate, pyruvate, and then go into gluconeogenesis, create some glucose. It can go lactate, pyruvate, and then go into the Krebs cycle you know, produce all of that. So it can go different ways, um, but it's really important in metabolism in general. Um, one, uh, a couple of the enzymes that you really want to remember, especially from this PowerPoint or from this slide, the LDH, like I said. So LDH, there's a couple different isomers, A, B, or two of them. They regulate the going back and forth between the lactate and the pyruvate. Um, then from pyruvate, once you have that, you have pyruvate dehydrogenase, and that's important for making the acetyl-CoA. And there's going to be some cofactors for the pyruvate dehydrogenase that'll be important going on um, later in the talk. So I told you I'm going to touch on acidosis. I'm not going to dwell on it because this could be a whole day's lecture um, in and of itself. But obviously, just a little reminder. Um, when we look at acid-base disorders, we're looking at the pH of the blood, right? Um, in addition to um, what we would call the anion gap, right? So you're calculating the different anions, figuring out what the difference is between those, and if there's a gap. So usually you either have a high or a normal anion gap. Um, there's exceptions, there's a low one, there's you know all sorts of metabolic disorders that we could talk about, but like I said, I'm not going to. Um, the high one is probably the one that we see a lot and I want to kind of focus on in this. So if you remember your old mnemonics from med school, you can use uh, gold mark or mud piles. So if you look here, I even put the mnemonic up there for you. Um, you've got the different types of lactate that would contribute to this high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, just for reminders, you can have a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, when I was refreshing myself on this, the mnemonic that they provided was fused CARS, which is not one that I learned in medical school. I learned the one that includes hyperalimentation, Addison's disease, RTA, diarrhea, acetazolamide, spironolactone, and saline infusion, which is obviously a different mnemonic. Um, so if you remember that one. Acidosis on the body causes um, a significant number of um, issues. They can be really mild, you know, you can get a headache, uh, 
they can be pretty severe. They can cause arrhythmias, um, cardiac arrest, can cause death. Um, hyperventilation is one of the first things that you can do as a compensation to a metabolic acidosis. Obviously, you want to blow off as much extra CO2 you can, um, which could help balance out that acidosis in some ways. Oops. So when you think about a lactic acidosis, so in this case, you know, we're thinking an acidemia, we've got a high anion gap, um, metabolic acidosis, and we're saying in this part that, okay, it's attributed to an elevated lactate level, right? Okay, where did this elevated lactate come from? There's a few different things that you can look into, and this is important in helping, you know, treat the patient and figure out your differential for what's going on. So there's two main types. There's type A and type B. Um, type A focuses more on the hypoperfusion and the hypoxia um, aspect of things. So it impairs the oxidative phosphorylation, decreased ATP synthesis and everything. And to survive, your cells will switch from an aerobic respiration to an anaerobic respiration, which goes down that pathway of using LDH to take the pyruvate, make it into lactate and go that way. Um, the main things that cause this type A would be shock. So you've got all the different types of shock as well. Um, myocardial infarction causing a you know, cardiogenic shock is actually the number one um, cause for type A lactic acidosis. So whenever you see a patient with lactic acidosis, if they've got, especially if they've got any cardiac history, that should be one thing that you're thinking of in your differential. Um, if they've got a pulmonary embolism, you know, causing an obstructive shock, that can also contribute to it. Obviously, you're impairing the oxygenation um, pathway and everything, so that could cause a different type of lactic acidosis. Um, hemorrhage, you don't have as much oxygen because you're bleeding out. Um, you aren't carrying that oxygen to the cells as efficiently. So hemorrhagic shock can cause it, and also septic shock, right? Your body is, um, is in demand of a higher need of oxygen for the metabolism and everything, and you just outgrow your oxygen you know, supply, essentially. The other things when you see um, elevated lactate um, that you should think about is, have they had seizures recently, or are they having seizures, right? that can cause an elevated lactate. Um, severe shivering can also cause it. Uh, and then bowel ischemia. So anytime, you know, we see it all the time. If somebody comes in and their lactate's like 10, you send them to the CT because you want to make sure you're not missing a bowel ischemia or something. Um, but like I said, the most common in type A is going to be the cardiac shock. Um, for type B, this is more of a, um, a disorder in, in the breakdown or clearance. It can be an increased production of it too, um, but it mostly focuses on the metabolism of it. So things like chronic alcoholism can cause an increased lactate, um, and this is mostly in a type B lactic acidosis. Um, some trauma, HIV could cause it. Um, you know, there's some thought that this, since this is more of a, a catabolic state, um, you are constantly using up oxygen, nutrients, everything, and so you can cause a lactic acidosis kind of at baseline in those states. Um, liver disease is another one as well. Obviously, I said 60% of the lactate is cleared by your liver or metabolized by your liver, so if you've got cirrhosis or some sort of acute hepatitis where your liver is not functioning, fulminant hepatitis, you're going to have a lactic acidosis as well. Um, medications, we all know about, you know, a lot of these medications, especially in the ICU, something to think about is propofol. Um, that can cause a lactic acidosis as well. But things like metformin, which nearly everybody is on, I know some of the endocrinologists say it's in the water now. Um, so that's something to think about. Linazolid can cause it, um, HAART meds, salicylates, isoniazid, alcohol, and cyanide, all of these can cause elevated lactate for one reason or another. Um, prevalence and incidence, you know, is a little bit hard to say um, in all of these because oftentimes there's a lot of um, different things causing a lactic acidosis, especially in hospitalized patients. So it's hard to say, you know, how common is 
um, linazolid causing a lactic acidosis in somebody. But it is something to keep in the back of your mind if you do have a patient presenting with this. Um, the other thing you want to think about are some enzyme deficiencies. G6PD is probably one that you think about the most and that may be tested um, on boards or something the most. Um, it's one that they really like to harp on. Um, you can also get nutritional deficiencies, which I'll kind of hit a little bit later, and those can also contribute to lactic acidosis because lots of different nutrients um, play a part in being cofactors for various enzymes, part of that glycolytic gluconeogenic process. Um, and then the one thing you can, you'll probably be like, you skipped it, um, leukemia and lymphoma. And I'm just going to take a little bit of a side, side jump on this one, but Leukemia and lymphoma in some um, solid tumors, some small cells and other things can cause a lactic acidosis. And this would be classified under a type B lactic acidosis. Um, and you may be like, why? So oftentimes, um, you know, cancer cells we know are rapidly dividing cells. They need nutrients, they need energy to continue this, um, to continue this replication and everything. So Otto Warburg in the 20s um, saw that they take up a lot of glucose. And what they do, despite having oxygen, they produce a lot of lactate. Now, the exact mechanism in all of that is still, people still argue about exactly what's going on. We have pretty good ideas, but you know, everyone kind of has their own take on it. And they find one thing and then turn around and say, actually, no, I think it's this. So this was kind of deemed the Warburg effect regardless. It's, you know, the fact that these cells are rapidly dividing and they're producing a lot of lactate along the way. Um, the thought was that it was from dysfunctional mitochondria um, and that the mitochondria were kind of the root of the cancer and the excess lactate production. Like I said, that's still being investigated. Um, but regardless, cancer cells have evolved to the point that to survive and to rapidly um, replicate, they need um, energy and they produce a lot of lactate along the way. So I give you a ton of information just now and you're like, why? Who cares? So just to recap what I talked about is this pretty little picture here. Um, if you have an elevated elevation in lactate, you kind of want to think about a couple different things, right? You have a patient coming in, their lactate's seven. Why? Is it an excess production, right? Is it um, an issue with metabolism? Are they in liver failure? Is their liver not clearing it? Um, and that could also be from the removal from the body aspect. So are the kidneys failing? You can have elevated lactate in all of those situations. And then you also want to think about, is it a type A or type B? So is it hypoxic, hypoxia-induced, or is it um, non-hypoxic driven, right? Um, what is causing this issue? Um, and two of the organs you always want to look at are the liver and the kidneys. So just keep that in mind. So monitoring lactic acid. Um, I'm going to hit a little bit on this and then I'll explain a little bit more. So one of the things that we associate, especially in the hospital, when you have a patient that's admitted, how often do you get, you know, a sepsis E alert, you know, message or something have you checked the lactic acid? Do you want to recheck the lactic acid? And part of that is because sepsis is really expensive and it's really deadly. Um, costs for the hospital ranges anywhere from 16000 to 50000 from what I could find. I think those are old numbers. It probably costs a lot more than that now. Um, when somebody has sepsis, it's associated with longer lengths of stay. They get a lot more complications long term. Um, and so early interventions and treatments of sepsis decreases length of stay. Lactic acid is a cheap and easy way to, you know, kind of uh, look out for organ dysfunction, right? So I already told you how you can get elevated lactic levels, right? There's all sorts of things that could contribute to it, which is why it's important to know the reasons why it could be elevated. And then you can kind of help differentiate hey, is this sepsis? Is this something else going on? So a test to just a serum lactate costs about 20 bucks. 
So it's a pretty cheap test when you consider that a procalcitonin is $70. So, you know, it's a third of the cost, a little bit more than a third of the cost of a procal. I'm not saying that a procal and a lactate are equivalent by any means, but just to kind of put in perspective the tests that we order and how much it costs in comparison to some other things. Um, so some of the importance of this, there are all sorts of studies on how lactic acidosis affects mortality, um, especially in the ICU. So this study in particular, it's a little bit old, but the, the data seems to um, kind of translate even throughout the years. Um, it's in 2011 by Jung et al., and they evaluated acidosis and mortality. And what they found was that a severe lactic acidosis, which they define as a lactate greater than four, um, was sort of common. It occurred in 6% of the ICU population that they studied, um, and they looked at 2,500 patients. So if those out of those patients... If their pH was less than 7.1 and their lactic acid was greater than 4, what they found was mortality was 57%, which is pretty high. Um, the other thing that they looked at was how severe the lactate was um, on presentation and how long it took for it to become a normal level, so what we would say probably less than 2, also was linked to mortality. Longer it took for it to normalize, the higher it was to begin with, the higher their mortality. Um, and then even more studies. Um, this one was from 2019, um, and it was showing, this was mostly focused on sepsis um, and lactic acid. So this was a retrospective cohort study. Um, they valued 3,300 patients. They found that a lactate cutoff level of greater than or equal to four um, had the best sensitivity and specificity to predict three-day mortality. So their sensitivity was 52%, um, but their specificity was 91%. So pretty good um, specificity there. Um, the one caveat in this study was that basically if they had sepsis, it didn't matter if their lactate was one or eight. Um, if they had sepsis, they had a higher rate of mortality. And that's why so much emphasis is put on identifying sepsis early and finding ways to accurately identify sepsis early. Um, but still, having a lactate greater than or equal to four was um, pretty important here. So why do we care, right? I've already hit on it a bunch of times. Any way to identify sepsis early um, is better for a patient, um, decreases mortality, helps decrease length of stay, decrease healthcare costs, all of the good things that we want, right? Um, it's so important, it's part of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, right? Now, most of this is coming from the 2016 guidelines. I know the 2021 guidelines have evolved slightly, um, but the recommendations still stand, right? Um, so what they recommend is, you know, you have an elevated lactate. Let me go through here. You have an elevated lactic acid level. If it's greater than or equal to four, you want to treat it pretty quickly. Um, you want to give them that 30 mil per kg bolus pretty much immediately. And then you want to keep remeasuring the lactate and make sure it's coming down appropriately. Um, if it was between two and four, you know, you're not quite, it's like 2.5, you still want to recheck it and make sure that it's not continuing to rise. Okay. But if I go back to this slide, um, something I thought was kind of interesting, and this was a more recent trial, um, and this was what was put into the 2021 Surviving Sepsis Guidelines, is there was a study called the Andromeda Shock Trial. Now, this was a pretty under, underpowered study. Um, it was intended to see if there were better ways to monitor perfusion status in patients, especially in low-income or low-resource areas. And one of the things they proposed was checking capillary refill time, um, you know, which is when you go through your notes and you go through the physical exam, cap refill. You know, most of us just are like, oh, yeah, it's less than two, you know, two to three, something like that. 
And what they did is they said, hey, if we just check this and we don't check lactic acid, is this still as accurate in helping you know, reduce mortality? And the interesting thing was that it, they didn't really show a difference. Now, that being said, I did say it was an underpowered study. Um, the controls were probably not great. It wasn't like a double-blinded study or anything. Um, and the other thing is they looked at outcomes to 28 days. Standardly, we look now a little further out to watch for mortality, and we look at 90 days rather than 28 days. Um, so that being said, that was part of it. But the 2021 guidelines, they use um, capillary refill as a weak recommendation to monitor perfusion status. So you can keep that in mind, kind of in the back of your mind. There's some thoughts that maybe um, combining that with lactic acid levels could be beneficial long term. Um, so like I said, I kind of went through this already. So lactic acid is really important um, in these guidelines, trying to identify and treat sepsis early on. Um, and your key is basically four or greater. Once you hit that mark, you really need to be looking at it um, and start figuring out what's going on. And to do that, what you want to do is fix the underlying cause, right? So is it type A, is it type B, is it hypoxic driven, non-hypoxic driven? So if it's shock, you treat it. If it's an MI, you know, you need to reperfuse um, the heart as quickly as possible. If it's um, an obstructive shock, you know, go in and do a thrombectomy. If it's hemorrhagic, give them blood. Um, if it's from seizures, remember I said seizures could cause an elevated lactate. Um, stop the seizures, treat the seizures, stop them. Um, if it's something like a toxic me megacolon or ischemic bowel, they need to go to surgery. You know, um, I'm not a surgeon, but surgical evaluation, let's say. Um, obviously, the first thing, though, is to give the IV fluid resuscitation. In some cases, you can mechanically ventilate it, ventilate the patient. Um, like I said, in DKA, for instance, the natural compensatory response is to hyperventilate, to try to get some of that excess acid out of the system. Um, so that is one thing you can do, though there is a lot of debate over whether or not that's better or not. Um, dialysis, so if you remember um, your mnemonic, obviously I like mnemonics, but if you remember your mnemonic for um, urgent indications for dialysis, A-E-I-O-U, right? A is, acidosis. So that would be an urgent indication for dialysis, especially if they have a refractory case of lactic acidosis. Give bicarb. There's all sorts of arguments both ways on it, right? Um, it's very controversial um, because it can actually, in you know, by way of the pathways that I kind of touched on earlier, it can increase the lactate. Um, so it doesn't always help. Um, there's, it can also raise the serum sodium, which can cause other issues. Um, it can lower your ionized calcium, which again, causes other issues. But the consensus is that if the pH is less than 7.1 and your serum bicarb is less than or equal to six, yes, give the bicarb because at that point, the benefits outweigh the risks. So what about thiamine? You say, that's pretty random. Why are you throwing thiamine in there? So if you remember back in my causes, um, I said that nutritional deficiencies can cause a lactic acidosis. One of the things that can cause that is thiamine. So just a quick refresher on thiamine. Um, it's also known as vitamin B1. It is a water-soluble vitamin. It's mostly absorbed in the small intestines. The active form is thi thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP. And again, you say, who cares? And that's because if you remember that enzyme that I told you to remember in aerobic respiration from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, that uses pyruvate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate dehydrogenase uses a coenzyme called thiamine pyrophosphate. That obviously requires thiamine, right? Um, if you don't have that, then what you get is a backup 
of that, you're not getting that progression into the Krebs cycle. You have a backup and a buildup of the pyruvate, which then goes into lactate, right? So you get a lactic acidosis from that. Where do you get thiamine? Um, you get it from whole grains, you get it from meat, fish, pork. Um, you can get it from some fruits and some nuts. In the US, our cereals and breads are fortified with thiamine. Um, obviously to help prevent this. It's a cheap and easy way to give people nutrients, right? Um, something to keep in mind, and I'll get back to this, asparagus, sweet potatoes, lentils, Brussels sprouts, oatmeal, oranges are very high in vitamin B1, okay? And why is that important? So who's at risk for deficiency? Alcoholics, right? They don't tend to have the best diet. They don't have a lot of nutrients coming in can also cause um, cirrhosis, which could then decrease the clearance or metabolism of that lactate. Um, older adults can have a thiamine deficiency. So you wanna think about the ones that are maybe on a tea and toast diet, right? Really cachectic looking, um, sickly looking older patients. They also have lots of multiple um, comorbidities. Um, patients with HIV or AIDS, like I said, um, the thought is that since they're kind of in a catabolic state, um, they're obviously using a lot of nutrients and they're not supplying, they're basically outgrowing their supply, right? Um, so they can have a deficiency as well. I thought this was interesting. People um, with diabetes, whether it's type two or type one diabetes are also at a risk for thiamine deficiency. Um, in general, they're found to have 50 to 75% lower levels um, than the general population not with diabetes. Um, bariatric surgery patients, they're at risk. You know, they don't, we know B12, you know, we know the standard vitamins and everything that they could be at risk for, but B1 is another one because that's not one that they're absorbing very well. Um, people that are in food deserts, and I almost wrote food desserts on here, which would also be accurate if somebody was in a food dessert they probably wouldn't get a lot of B1. But if they're in a food desert, you know, they are not getting a lot of the healthier foods, whether it's because of cost or access, um, all of that. And one of the reasons I say all that and I go back to this is these are kind of expensive things. You know, if you go to the grocery store and you look at the price of nuts, they're expensive. Um, meat is expensive. And a lot of these fruits and um vegetables, you know, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, these tend to be a little bit more of the pricey vegetables. It's not your basic, you know, you can't grab a bunch of carrots for a dollar and, you know, get your all your vitamin B1 that you need. So people who live in food deserts, which can be, you know, we see a lot of that here. Um, so that's always something to keep in mind. Um, when people do have a thiamine deficiency, something that we think about often is something like Wernicke's, right? Um, that's when they get the encephalopathy, the gait ataxia, the ophthalmoplegia. Uh, and we think about that a lot in alcoholics. Um, you can also see dry berry berry, wet berry berry. Um, and then something else that you can see is possibly a refractory lactic acidosis because of what everything that I just went through. Um, so thiamine treatment, there are a few studies and there was an interesting case report that I'm talking about here um, from 2021 that was talking about treating the refractory lactic acidosis with thiamine in a non-alcoholic patient. So this was a 63-year-old female who presented with hypoglycemia um, and she had severe lactic acidosis. Her blood sugar level improved after they gave dextrose but her lactic acidosis persisted for days despite fluids and empiric antibiotics. You know, they looked at all the causes of lactic acidosis that they could find and they ruled out pretty much everything. And kind of as a last ditch effort, they said, well, here, let's give her some thiamine and see what happens. And as soon as she started high dose thiamine, which would be 500 milligrams TID, her lactic acid resolved, acidosis resolved. Um, they thought about this because she was kind of sickly looking. She was kind of skinny. You know, they thought maybe she's got a nutritional deficiency and just threw it at her to see what would happen. And it helped a lot. So why would they even do that? Right. Um, 
if you guys have ever ordered a thymine test to check a thymine level, B1 level, it takes a long time to come back, right? Patients usually like discharge by the time it comes back. Um, so it takes a while to look at that, um, but you can kind of look at your patient and think about all those different reasons why they may have a thymine deficiency like I talked about, right? Um, do they live in a food desert? Do they have HIV? You know, do they have, are they an alcoholic? Um, and then you can empirically treat them. And why would you do that? Well, it's safe. There's not actually a toxic level that's been identified. Any excess just gets filtered out through the kidneys. Um, it's water soluble, right? It's not fat soluble. Those are the ones that we really have to worry about with toxicity. Um, it's pretty cost effective. I was looking up different costs online um, and obviously there's a pretty big range and costs are kind of hard to accurately disclose, especially in um, mass production and everything to hospital groups. But from what I could tell, maybe 20 to $30 for a day's worth of high dose thiamine. So that's um, 500 milligrams TID. And you give that for three days um, and then you can start tapering off slowly. Um, I say that it's readily available with the caveat that back in 2005, 2006, there was a pretty severe shortage of it. Um, but that's because there was only one manufacturer at that time. Um, that has changed a lot. There have been some shortages here and there, um, but kind of the same as everything. It's not something that's really, really been difficult to get. Um, so it's really cheap, it's safe, um, and when you're in a, in a bind where you're just not getting improvement, no matter what you do, it doesn't hurt to try it. Um, so like I said, the conclusion of all of this, I know we kind of went through a bunch of different topics that are all related in some form or another, but lactic acidosis is a poor prognostic indicator, especially in the ICU, but in general, um, higher lactic acid levels can be um, associated with higher mortality. Um, so you need to know the reasons why they may have a lactic acidosis, right? Is it hypoxic? Is it non-hypoxic? Is it a clearance issue? What is the cause of this higher lactic acid level? Um, and by knowing that, then you can treat it more quickly, right? If it's, like I said, cardiogenic shock, get them to the cath lab. If it's septic shock, treat them. You know, get source control, all of that. Um, but something to really keep in mind is nutritional deficiencies, right? And it's something we often look over. We don't often focus on nutrition, but it is something that can be associated um, with refractory lactic acidosis, um, especially the thymine. So coming back to my question initially, um, for those of you who weren't here initially, I'll just kind of briefly go over it. So it was a 44-year-old female alcoholic she had known B-cell lymphoma, not on chemo. She was admitted to the ICU with shock and acute renal failure. She had 36 hours of vanco amerum and appropriate IV fluids. Her MAP was kind of stable. WBCs were somewhat increased. Now she's oliguric and encephalopathic. She has a persistent acidosis with a bicarb of seven, lactic acid of eight, and the rest of the information, everything else is within normal limits. So what do you wanna do? Please somebody answer this correctly. Well, if they don't, we can talk about it, right? Right. Who, anyone have an idea? A, B, C, or D? D. D? D. Great job. Um, you did a great job answering that. Yes, you would give thiamine. Uh, you know, you could argue some of the other things in here, especially because I didn't tell you how many pressers they were actually on, right? Um, I didn't tell you, do they have risk factors for a fungal infection? You could argue a lot of this, but given my presentation and everything, that is something that you want to keep in mind is, hey, why don't we give them thymine and see what happens? And that's all I've got for you guys. Do you have questions? Yes. Here we go. Great presentation. Um, so the thiamine, um, uh, I guess for uh, lactic acidosis, uh, do you know if there are any trials on that? Like, that would be so interesting to, like, study. Yeah, I didn't see any active trials. It looks like it's becoming more of a focus of study. Um, and I know some of the ICU attendings have started doing that. You know, you've got this patient that's just not getting better. And it's like, hey, let's give them some thiamine. And sometimes it works. Um, but there's not an official trial that I saw 
um, unless somebody else knows of one that is actually working on that. But uh, I guess anecdotally, you've seen it kind of work. I have seen it work to an extent. I think the problem is that some of these patients, especially in the ICU that are so sick and they're at this point that, you know, you're like, what can I throw at the wall and see what sticks? Their chance, their, their mortality is very high by that point anyway. Um, but whether or not you can see a lab value improve, yeah, I have seen the lab value improve a little bit. Um, didn't change the outcome necessarily at that point, but it did change the lab value. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really good talk. A great talk. Thank you. Um, I just um, wanted to mention we have we actually have a patient upstairs right now who we think has um, uh, berry berry. You know, the other thiamine deficiency with um, had a, a, both a neuropathy. Um, wasn't really confused, but also had high output heart failure and lactic acidosis. And um, the thiamine deficiency was initially missed. It was picked up by one of our APPs. But um, one other thing that I've come across is some, the thiamine, besides taking a long time, the peripheral thiamine measurements are often inaccurate. So I've heard from a bunch of people like, just don't trust them, just give the thiamine. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a Great talk, difficult topic. Oh, one one other thing is we've I've I've seen a couple of cases in people who are on weird diets to lose weight. Like well, I saw a woman who was very wealthy and she only ate shellfish and she got. And then uh, I've also it's also seen not infrequently in hyperemesis gravidarum. Um, so um, I've 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 uh, seen it once there too, and it was in the books. But yeah, it's a great thing to think of. Great job, Dr. Peralta. Thanks.